I'm Roxanne MacDonald and I'm descended from the Central Queensland mob. Adolescence is a confusing and difficult time for most teenagers, but Indigenous kids who often start life with significant health disadvantages do it even tougher. In this program, Deadly Steps, we'll be looking at three inspiring examples of projects that have been designed to nurture and encourage Indigenous adolescents including a football academy in WA, a drop-in centre in the Northern Territory, <laughs> All right, we'll stop it there anyway, that's good. and an early intervention centre near Griffith in New South Wales. Yeah, he missed a bit in there. We'll also be hearing from experts such as Tom Kalmer, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner and Race Discrimination Commissioner. Associate Professor Helen Milroy, Director for the Centre for Aboriginal Medical and Dental Health at UWA, and Associate Professor Ted Wilkes, Chairperson of the National Indigenous Drug and Alcohol Committee. Young Indigenous people experience more stressful life events than their non-Indigenous counterparts. They may have a poorer diet and nutrition, and they're more likely to suffer from a serious health disability. Let's hear the experts explain some of the reasons for this. An Indigenous person dies on average 17 years younger than a non-Indigenous person. Uh, men die younger than women. Um, and that's, that's really the headline that we've got to look at. And there's a whole range of reasons why that happens. And there's a whole lot of different responses that need to take place to make sure it happens. But what's important to recognise is that this is not just an issue to do with health. Even though we use health as, as the, the, the key indicator, mm. it's to do with all the other things, what we call the social determinants that, that influence the way a person lives a healthy life. The social determinants are really important in regard to mental health. What we know is that it's a two-way relationship. So if you're living in a state of poverty and, and poor social circumstances, then that actually causes additional stress on families and that can then lead on to mental health problems. We also know that for those families that suffer from significant mental health problems, they end up drifting down in the, their socioeconomic status, so they actually end up in more states of poverty. So it is a two-edged sword. As we, as we well know from all of the data on Indigenous families, they're, they're, most likely, they're, they're more likely to experience the more extreme levels of disadvantage on basically all indicators. So for example, unemployment, um, inability to own their own home, low income, uh, other issues such as poor food supply, uh, poor housing conditions, overcrowding, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, that they tend to have too many sort of indicators of disadvantage all at once which actually contribute to a very high level of stress. Mm -hmm. And we also know that an impoverished social environment is also a risk factor for good child development. So children basically need a reasonably stimulating environment but also a peaceful and calm environment to maximise their potential. And what we know from some of the um, indicators for Indigenous families that sometimes children are living in very impoverished circumstances, but sometimes they're also exposed to a lot of other community and family stresses such as violence as well. So the, the environments themselves are not conducive to good child development. Comparing Aboriginal children to non-Aboriginal children, we found that there was a higher rate of Aboriginal kids who had had what we call life stress events. And uh, these life stress events are around losing um, loved ones in the family, um, being forced from your house because you, you, your mum and dad haven't paid the rent or not being able to pay the rent, um, seeing, seeing people, loved ones in uh, domestic violent situations, um, um, mothers and grandmothers and, and older sisters, um, and it goes on and on. And it, you know, there are things like a child um, having been sexually molested when they're young. That's, that's something which um, must have a great impact on, on uh, the psyche and the resilience of children to get through. So that's what I'm saying, we've got to stop a lot of this. People are underestimating what happens to young children, particularly in these impoverished circumstances. They are the vulnerable people in the world and if there are perpetrators and predators out there, these children are, are, um, are vulnerable to that sort of, um, or those sorts of people as well.
In general, many of the children I see in the service have experienced a lot of trauma, but certainly the Indigenous families have been exposed to a lot more trauma, and often over a shorter period of time. For example, there may have been several deaths in a family over a short period of time, and that really just overwhelms the family in terms of their coping mechanisms and resources. And certainly if you look at something like the Western Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey, that showed that for Indigenous families, something like 22% of children are living in families that have experienced seven or more major life um, event, major life stress events in the preceding 12 months to the survey. So that means that those, those kids and families are experiencing a lot more stresses than um, non-Indigenous families in the community. So that really puts a lot of extra pressure um, on those families. You know, if Dad's got a good job, able to be able to uh, provide, wonderful. It's a matter of also in the education system saying, well, if kids need a little bit more support around homework, Let's, let's provide that. Let's provide something that the kids and the parents don't normally have access to and that is good homework environments. Let's provide that. Let's provide children, even at that age, with, with uh, proper, proper meals. I don't, if, if in the world that we know Aboriginal people only earn um, you know, uh, about a half and maybe a little bit more than what the normal, the normal Australian earns, then they're depleted. Let's make sure that they're able to give their kids a feed. If they can't, let's provide breakfasts. Let's provide um, meals that will allow these kids to be nourished throughout, throughout the day. There are communities where breakfast programs are, are being implemented. Um, there are programs where people have, have uh, extended the cultural variables to include things like Australian Rules Football. Australian Rules Football is a, is a magnificent addition to what I call the culture of, uh, of this country. Right? It's, it belongs to us all and it belongs to these Noongar kids and they love it and Noongars and Aboriginal kids who play sport and chase footballs around and compete with one another, they love that sort of stuff. Well that brings us to the East Kimberley Football Academy which is having an amazing impact on the health, self-esteem and school retention rates of young men in Kununurra. I'm the uh, director of the East Kimberley Football Academy, controlled by the Clontarf Foundation. The CEO of, of Clontarf is a guy called Jared Neesham, who's very well known in football circles. He was also a teacher, and uh, he sort of stumbled upon an idea once he was asked to teach at a very difficult um, school with um, very poor attendance, very poor behaviour standards amongst the boys, mainly an Indigenous population. And he had no success until he uh, started running a football program at this school and all of a sudden there was not enough chairs for the boys to sit on. Um, attendance was fantastic, behaviour standards in improved and uh, he's just sort of moved on from that very small example and opened up all of these academies. So what we're doing now is we've gone through our, our stores and we've written down what we already have. The East Kimberley Footy Academy is a, an educational life skills program, it's not just a football program, that operates under the umbrella of Kununurra District High School. The program uh, works in sort of almost two uh, sections. What we have is a number of what we call mainstream okay. boys whose attendance before Clontarf arrived was reasonable, behaviour standards are reasonable, there's a reasonable amount of family support. Those guys are all members of the East Kimberley Footy Academy, however they stay in normal mainstream classes for their education. So we see them three times a week for uh, options, we see them for footy training, for camps, excursions, for leadership meetings and so on. We also have a second section and this is a little bit unusual for academies. We have what's called our CALS class which is the Clontarf Academy Life Skills class. This class is run for boys with 
less family support, uh, at-risk students, very low literacy and numeracy uh, levels. Uh, a number of the boys in our CALS class have almost never attended school, so they have a specialised Clontarf class and that has made a huge difference to the operation of the school. The Clontarf program's had a huge impact in the school. Um, one of its most noticeable impacts has been the return of students to school who've had a history of either non-attendance or very poor attendance. Um, one case in particular, a uh, student last year with an attendance profile of 37% attendance across the year. Uh, to date this year that child's attendance is in the vicinity of between 85 and 90%, which is four and a half days a week, as opposed to one and a half days a week. Retaining the male uh, Indigenous students within the school is significant in that it uh, provides us with an opportunity to sustain their attendance and to actually get them to complete school with some prospect of completing Year 12 at a vocational or at a uh, university type level. Well, let's go, boys. The success of the program, I think, is based on a number of things. Football for Indigenous boys is almost like a religion. It is just a really strong passion. And these boys' self-esteem is often very low because in the education system, because they're so far behind, they haven't attended school, they are consistently getting very negative messages. Most of the guys are very skilled at football, so all of a sudden their self-esteem improves because they've been told they're fantastic players, they watch themselves on videos, they see their photos in the paper. So that's a very important part of the program. You got it. If you're just going to, you know, let it roll over the line, it's going to happen in the game. That's what we don't want, guys. The program is okay. run by a number of male mentors. Now, in most of these boys' lives, there are no significant males. They are just non-existent and it's probably one of the things that they lack the most. So they are being surrounded by are males from the time they get to school to the time they leave. There's a lot of my staff on weekends actually take kids out fishing and um, completely separate to the program. Another one here, Al. Need barking again. My name's Trevor Menmuir. I'm the football operation officer uh, here at Kununurra District High School. Uh, my job is uh, organising carnivals trips away. You guys all go on Halls Creek next week? Uh, reward activities here in the school. With the artefacts program, I do three periods where we come out and make boomerang, shields, spears, uh, kulamans, and once we've finished with them, we go into town and sell them to the, the local uh, artefact shops. And so you don't have to be a good footballer. There's uh, a lot of other things we do besides football going on camps, you know, they might be good at fishing or other good skills that they've got and it's not just all footy. Yeah, when they're ready, you can have, what's it like? Have a look at the veggies. Lift them off. Beautiful. Fridays we work on cooking a meal. We all cook a meal up, so they're cooking a roast dinner. We had them peeling the spuds and, you know, all the basic sort of stuff, but washing their hands, learning the basic skills of hygiene, um, the whole idea of preparation, the whole idea of then serving it and serving it in a systematic way, then the clean up, the wash up. So the, the modelling overall, the, the approach I've taken for many years, is trying to use ordinary activities and to make them a vehicle for that broader educational journey. So whether it be playing a game of footy and you've got to learn to turn up, to train, to work as a team, now that applies if you're running a house. What are we going to eat Monday night, guys? What, what food? Someone said chops. You know, what is your personal responsibility in the house? What's the collective responsibility of the members of a home? Um, what are the skills you need to be an effective father? After this, they've got to move out to the community, so they've got to follow the, the rules of the rest of society. You know, there's, there's behaviour that's expected here at school, which is completely different to the behaviour down the street or in their home. Right, yeah. Now, when you're away, we looked at north, yeah. south, yeah. east, west. good boy, west. They're learning good manners, how to speak to people, how to look people in the eye to speak, and, and that's what we're trying to do as an adjunct to the educational and sporting program. Yeah. 
My name is Gary Gerard. I'm an Aboriginal education officer. And I just go around the class, mainly this class, just to help Aboriginal young boys, like with the spelling, the word, even the English. Like when Ray um, doesn't understand them, that's when I'm coming. I'm transferred from the Aboriginal English into uh, standard English, what Australians talk. Okay, quickly, boys, make a circle. Not too close. But last year, one of these boys was suspended 25 times in one year. This year, not one. I haven't had one of these boys suspended this year. We need to finish off that cereal, boys, in those boxes, then we can open some more new ones. A really important part of the CONCAF program is breakfast. The majority of the boys that come in, especially the Cal's boys, have no breakfast and many of those guys would have had no dinner as well. Fresh peaches this morning. So they really come to rely on the food that we do provide. We use fruit and cereal and um, it helps with concentration for the boys throughout the day. It's all part of the healthy living story that we spread. The impact uh, of the program um, has been significant, so there's been uh, massive improvement in behaviour standards and significant improvements in attendance. But the, the full impact of the program won't be seen for probably another three years because uh, the graduation rates of Indigenous boys at Kununurra District High School have been very low. Um, one and zero are, are the normal sort of numbers. We, we would like in you know, four or five years time to have to be finding every year jobs for maybe 15, 20, 25 Indigenous graduates from school. Football certainly works for the boys. Another way to support adolescents is to encourage them to communicate, to talk not only with their peer group, but with people they respect in their community. And we need to learn to listen to them, really listen when they talk about themselves, their lives, their hopes and worries. Well, we're talking about probably the most vulnerable group of kids, and they're the group that, that are probably more likely to, to be experimenting with, uh, with uh, drugs and, and alcohol. Um, they're experimenting with, uh, uh, with sexual relations uh, with other people. And they're also the most susceptible, uh, unfortunately, to self-harm. And, and so we've got to make sure that the environment that they're living and working in is one where people can feel secure, that they can feel confident that they are part of the system. So it's important, especially if we can uh, have been working with them for some time, that they, they can feel secure. We've got to listen. As well, we also need to look at the physical health side of things. So for some of our young people, they've already experienced a level of ill health as younger children. And we certainly know that in our young women um, through adolescence, they're probably likely to suffer from high rates of things like anemia. And so that also takes a toll, not only on their health, but on their mental health. So if you're not very physically robust and you have these other stressors, that's going to make it very difficult for your development. I do believe it's, it's going to need some uh, short, mid and long term solutions, but in the immediacy we certainly have a sick Aboriginal population or a, or a diminished um, and unhealthy Aboriginal population in many regards. Some of us are okay. Um, we need to certainly provide the appropriate um, interventions or the prevention programs that need to be put in place. We need uh, um, uh, a, a better compassion and tolerance of, of what Aboriginal people want. We need to develop curriculum so that it's more appropriate for Indigenous Australians. I think what we're finding today is people are still making comment about whether we, we teach English as a second language um, or vice versa. Um, we need to get that right. We need to make sure at the local level that those things are taken care of. I don't think one size fits all on this. I think uh, whilst we try to, to maintain a, um, a standard curriculum, we, we diminish the, the respect for ourselves as human beings and um, our kids in particular come from a variety of different cultural backgrounds now. Indigenous Australians more often than not are saying we want to learn our kids how to, um, to respect the kinship systems that we, we have. We want to learn our, our children how to respect the land and uh, those practices of hunting and gathering which we still do in a modern way. Um, we still want children to have 
respect for the spirit that is, that is the Noongar spirit or the Aboriginal spirit? Well, I think we need to get to know our young people and understand the stresses and strains that they are under. The other thing that also happens for our um, teenagers is that sometimes they become a carer for another person in the family and sometimes take on a parenting role for younger children. So I think we really need to understand the reality in which they live and what it's like for them, the pressures that they're under and support them the best way we can. Listen to kids. Uh, they have a view and, and, and treat them with respect and make sure that they have enough information to be able to make an informed decision because by nature Aboriginal Islander kids are inquisitive, you know, that's their relationship with land. So one is, is listening. The second is to help them understand their place in the education system and what the education system can offer them, uh, which is important. That doesn't matter whether it's health education or the formal education system. It's got to be within their frame of reference. And I guess the third one, uh, which is uh, equally important, is to hel help let them uh, involve their parents and in, in the education system, help them encourage their parents, help them to support their parents to get involved. The best thing that we can do for our young people is understand their situation, not label them, not be judgmental, but actually get to know them first before we actually find ways to help them. And sometimes it's our young people that are best at telling us what they need instead of us telling them what they need. In Palmerston near Darwin, youth workers make a point of asking the kids what they want from their service. Here's a deadly example of the benefits of peer support and having a special place where they can hang out together. Danila Dilber Youth Service is located in Grey, which is a suburb of Palmerston, which is a satellite city and probably about 20 minute drive from Darwin. We have about 10% Indigenous population, so it's fairly high needs as well. We try and cater to needs of youth aged between 10 and 20, Indigenous youth, within the Palmerston area. I see a lot of boredom around Palmerston, and from that boredom, issues like drug and alcohol abuse, violence. I reckon that all the issues are mainly caused by boredom, and other family issues as well. Our premises used to be a bakery and when we came here there wasn't anything here at all. So we had a number of things put in the floor and a laundry area for young mums, kitchen area for when we do cooking activities, pool tables, so on and so forth. One of the ideas of the drop-in centre to begin with was that young people would come in here to the drop-in centre just to hang out, but that right next door were our offices where we've got our youth workers and a counsellor on site and if there were any issues or problems they've got direct access to us. But in the meantime we're developing relationships <laughs> with those young people in a positive environment and leading by example which is what we want of our youth workers so the people in this area relate to them very well. Karina is a strong young female and Peter is a strong young male. So they're absolute assets to our team. I think that because of the input that we've had from youth around Palmston, that we've made it a, a safe place, a, like a place that they can just come and not feel shame and just, this is their zone. All right, so basically what we do out here is we do drop-ins. So that's Karina and I, we both uh, run that. Available in here is the counselling service to Indigenous young people only. Most of the kids that we target are disengaged young people, but we get various from schools, kids that work, and that's just part of the job, I suppose, going out, picking up the kids, making sure they all get here safely and that we can just have them all there ready to go. Otherwise, you're waiting another hour. We'll be there in 10 minutes, an hour later, you're still waiting. So. If we go and get them, that way they're all here at once. Yeah, this is great school. This is where a lot of our kids come from. Usually I said we get about 10, 15, 20 on a good day and plus on a better day. Well, I grew up out here and I used to run around with all the rough heads, you know, and a lot of the boys that I, that I do come in contact with all the little brothers of the bigger brothers that I used to run with, so they all know us and 
yeah, the respect's there and, and you've got to give it first, you know. All right, we'll do another countdown. Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> We'll stop it there anyway, that's good, that's fine. A couple of years ago we run the Strong Women Strong Futures program which was a joint partnership between Anglicare Connect Youth programs and Janela Dilby Youth Service. It was a five week pilot program and at the end of that program the young women indicated their interest to see something in the same or similar form continue and today is the first session of our Sisters Young Women's Program. Well, first of all, I would like to say welcome to you all. Thanks heaps for coming. We hope that uh, you'll stay with the program. Um, our program's activities focused, so a lot of the things that we do, are events and activities, based on what young people want in this area. So when we first came here, we went around and spoke to a lot of young people and a lot of the programs that we have running now are based on the feedback that we got from them. Beauty, hair and beauty. Fishing. Yeah, that's bush activity. What do we want? The first session that we're having, we'll be sitting down with those young women and looking at the sorts of things that they're interested in and trying to structure the rest of the program around that. So we'll be looking at health, we'll be looking at legal stuff, topics around domestic violence, parenting, uh, education and training opportunities, confidence and self-esteem. First aid, you need that some places in case you want to get a job and it's always handy. Um, our rights, so we know in case we get pulled over by police or something and ask you questions, you know what to say. Financial advice, so how to budget and how to save and teach you how to apply for a loan. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Is um, that it? Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thanks very much, Jaylene. Thank well done. Much. We'll get speakers in. Anyone seen how pandanus mats and baskets made before? Anyone seen the process? Yeah. All right. So what normally happens is that it's stripped in half and then you use this part to make the basket. But at the start, we'll just start making bracelets, eh? If you don't want to do it now, you can take some home, take a pack and then practice. We'll also do some fun activities as well. We might just watch a DVD one afternoon or we might be out rock climbing, <laughs> who knows? The reason why we came because um, it was boring at home and came here to check it out, to have fun, yeah. And it is pretty good, so we'll probably come back here another two weeks I enjoyed it today. One of the big things that came out of the talks and surveys and focus groups that, that we had was music. That is, anything that's centred around music, kids absolutely love. A lot of things revolve around music. DJing, rapping. Um, dancing at discos, they want to organise discos so that there's something to do on a Friday night or on the weekend. We had a group that we took to Crockfest three years in a row and just the process of getting the young people involved to begin with, starting rehearsals about six weeks before and then working them through that until the night of the performance, you just see a huge change, transformation some of the young people that we had involved had never performed before and just seeing them go from being a little bit shy, a little bit shame job to actually getting on stage and performing in front of a thousand people, there were audiences with about a thousand people, was uh, pretty amazing stuff to see. Eight, nine, eighty-nine, a baby was born, a baby so fine, that baby was me, but now I've grown, I've already learned to provide my own, so now I'll be living in mold, and with my parents that drive a hold, and now ain't that mad, I'm so glad, no I ain't trying to be bad, I don't want to be on the run from the gun, yeah that's right son, we going to Palmerston, with the rest you know we is the best, yes we're smart, and we're taking part. No, that's from my heart. Hey, well, that's all I'm going to say. Catch you later, hey.
It's obviously really helpful for those young women to share their experiences with each other. But everyone reacts differently to stressful events and young boys often become aggressive and that brings them more trouble. Men tend to be more action oriented in general so they deal with their problems in a slightly different way and so again our young boys may end up getting into trouble with the police or with aggression or, or um, with drugs and alcohol. Uh, our young women may uh, as well experience anxiety or depression in a way that makes them feel more socially isolated. They may also turn to drugs and alcohol of course. Mm. Um, but I think that sometimes our boys get get sort of um, labelled with aggressive behaviour without understanding what's behind that behaviour. And behaviour in itself doesn't mean anything. It's actually what drives the behaviour that's important. And I think for some of our young boys, they miss out on people being compassionate because they're being seen as aggressive, but in actual fact, they're suffering. And we need to really look at that and not mislabel them. We're pretty dominated by non-Aboriginal people teaching us. Um, and uh, look, those teachers that have stood up and uh, endeavoured to teach across cultural, cultural parameters sometimes have tried to do the best they can um, with not the right resources to do it and the right understanding. So some of our kids at that age need additional support. They come from a different cultural background. The mothers and fathers are already intimidated by what they see as an education system that doesn't really do it right. So we need to make sure that for that child, all of those important stakeholders and the resources are put in place properly. So it might be that um, for, for Aboriginal children, we, we step outside of the normal square and we say, how do we, how do we implement cultural variables for Aboriginal children to undertake while they're going through the education system without diminishing their ability to reach those benchmarks, which we which we've established in this mainstream. I think one of the big issues for teenagers in particular is that primary school in a way is a reasonably supportive environment. However, once you get into high school, it, it becomes a very different sort of environment. And there's a lot of other issues that young people face. And I guess there's exposure to other things such as drug and alcohol use and, and other sorts of acting out type behavior that can occur in that age group. Once a kid drops out of the education system, they feel as though um, they're probably, not only have they lost the plot, um, they're no longer got um, the respect of mums and dads and people who they want the respect from. And, uh, you know, what do you do? In New South Wales near Griffith, what they did was start a unique program specially designed for troubled Aboriginal boys aged 12 to 15. Come on free one! <laughs> Tacandy Inabarra is an early intervention centre for Aboriginal boys aged between 12 and 15 years um, and it's hoping to keep Aboriginal boys out of the criminal justice system. Pat, you want to get the gate mate? We're on a 780 hectare property and uh, it's in central southern New South Wales basically about 60 kilometres from Griffith in the Riverina. To Candy Inabarra means to learn to dream and the vision of this place is boys to men learning to live their dream. Hey guys, I got some really good awards from last week. Creative Writing Award very, to Dallas very. Murray. Woo well done, Dallas. Well done, Dallas. <laughs> and I think we might try and get that published in the school news at the end of the year. Not every boy that comes in here has had contact with the criminal justice system, but some have. Um, some at minor uh, levels of conferencing um, and others with cautions. Some have been charged with some offences, but minor offences, and they're not classified um, as repeat offenders. Oh, that's lovely. Approximately 50.5% of children incarcerated in juvenile justice facilities are Aboriginal boys. And of that 50.5, 85% of those boys go on to life in the criminal justice system as an adult. So the main aim is to teach these boys that there is an alternate pathway in life. Because a lot of these boys have no expectations of themselves 
and the ability to achieve. And this is to teach them to make better decisions for themselves and therefore change the course of their life. We have had a very positive impact on their life. Their self-esteem, a lot of them that have come in here, and there's quite a few that have come in with a very, very low self-esteem, probably more like an identity type problem, you know, who am I, I don't really belong here or there or... But after being here for a term, um, a lot of them have realised who they are, I guess. Six, seven, where's the other two? Need to come over here now, cuz, quick. Oi, okay. you no, are here! Worry. Listen, but I want to tell you something. At the moment, there's choices to be made in life, is that right? All of us got to make a choice in life. These boys are choosing not to come over. So are they helping themselves from becoming boys to, uh, to become men? No, nah, they're staying as boys. You blokes have made a choice to come over here and do the right thing, so I give us each of you a pat on the back that you're halfway at least there to becoming men, because that's what this place is about. I told you these dances we do are important because they're as close as what we can get back to our tribal times for initiation. Okay? This identifies you as Aboriginal fellas and you might never ever get an opportunity to do this stuff again so you need to take the opportunity now and to take it serious alright spread yourselves around get ready for the first dance <laughs> Some of these boys basically have never identified, they know that they're blackfellas. Um, it's easy to look at your skin and say, yeah, I'm a blackfella, but they're wandering around in a world that's foreign to them. Um, even though they're living within society, um, they don't really tend to abide by a lot of the rules. And I've put this down to actually having no identity and being lost to their tradition and their culture. Now, it's getting them to realise that they are of an age where they know uh, right from wrong and also how important it is for them to move from the point that they are as young boys in a place like the candy to move on to actually expand their lives and to grow in the things here um, and in their culture and identity to become the men that they that they richly deserve to be and they want to be okay boys this one of the scar trees that was found on this property by the size of it, you could be looking at a Coleman or a shield. We're doing work at the moment on the environment and there's an emphasis on how the Aboriginal culture knew how to make the most of the natural resources that we've got and knew how to respect the environment. We kept a search for these sorts of things and a few sticks. The same as we did a healthy living unit last term. And we talked a lot about what they need to do to try to bring back their natural, healthy lifestyle. It was good, fun. It's better than the way I used to live and all that. Everything was going bad. But when I came here, I felt better about not getting into trouble. I felt better about school, learning about my culture, which I didn't know. Learning to play the didgeridoo, learning to dance, learning different stuff every day. Kept me out of trouble. Been going good ever since then. Yeah. Most of the boys who come to Tikandi are from very diverse backgrounds. Some come from perfectly well balanced homes, where they, they might be just truanting from school. Others come from really dysfunctional households, where they've seen and been the victim of a lot of abuse. So they're wandering the streets, starting to get into trouble, hanging out with um, older people and coming to the notice of police. And therefore they're at a big risk of becoming entrenched in the juvenile justice system. Oh, tell him, Uncle Dave. You'll get it back, don't panic. He's going to put it on pen now. No, he's not. No, I'm not. Some of the fellas who come here, the literacy and numeracy levels are way down, sometimes a stage one or two, which is kindy up to year three level. You tell me which one's right. Which way will which you go you home or the wicked witch cast a spell? Which one do you want? What do you say to me? Which way will you go yeah. home? Plus. That's the same as that. 
So what we try yep. to do here is keep them safe, for one thing, and keep them going with programs so they understand then that it's a better option than truanting. Yeah, he, he missed a bit in that. He did. The boys uh, come to Dakini in in one of two ways. They can actually apply themselves or they can be referred or we call sponsored into the program by their parents or government agencies such as docs or juvenile justice and they're here from three to six months. When the boys arrive here they engage in a program that works from seven o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night and that keeps them active and focused and it's a whole incremental learning program but the boys respond really well to that rigour it gives them uh, trust. Trust that something is certain in their day and they know what time they've got to get up, they know what time they've got to go to school, they know what time they've got to go to bed. Because after all, they're boys. These are children and they respond really well to rigour and rules. With some of the boys here, they have no idea of even simple things like keeping themselves clean or doing their own washing or doing their own meals and it's all taught to them. So by the end of the time they leave here, they can survive. Good job, Dan. I don't know what time to walk. Well, you know, I'm going to take you like a drink bottle, OK? What do you think about rules, John? I'm going to put it away. In my box. No, you're not. You're going to put that in my box. Back at the back. No, right? On arrival there's a lot of bullying and there's a lot of arguing and shoving and all the rest of it while they sort out their own pecking order. There's a lot of boys who think the only way to be top dog is to be the baddest, meanest person here. And that's a very difficult time for us because there's a lot of poor behaviour. Don't be fucking good. No. Can you feel happy to be good? No. Don't you be talking to me like that. I don't talk to you like that. Don't be good. The vast majority of boys that come here have unacceptable behaviour. They've got learned behaviours. They don't know how to respond to anger. They don't know how to respond to being challenged. Um, or in fact, even if they don't know how to do something, they respond inappropriately. You have a little bit of respect, Adrian. You are not Well, don't talk to me like that in the first place, OK? Yeah, I'll open the door. I'm not going to Right, so when you flip it up and catch it, then flip it down and see if you can hit it. What Takini does here is to build their confidence, their self-confidence, and let them know that it's okay not to know how to do something and everybody's got to learn. Okay. Can you lead me around for a second? I'll give you a lead around. And over the course of time, that self-esteem and self-confidence grows and with that comes the behavioural change. Yay! Very good. Friday is reward day. We're going to go into um, Griffith to do some 10 pin bowling again like we did last Friday. If they're behaving badly, they get a red card and they get a consequence for poor behaviour, which means that they've got to wash extra dishes or sweep extra floors or something like that. If they're behaving badly but they, they stop when they're challenged about that behaviour and they start to modify their behaviour, then we say they're deadly. We celebrate that. If they're behaving well, then we say they're a warrior and they get a reward for that. Okay, three bronze awards for five green cards in a row, uh, without a yellow or without a red, and that's to Billy Briggs. Well done, Billy. Great effort, mate. Good boy. If they're warriors and they're behaving well, um, then they get a prize like a pair of jeans or a, or a good shirt, or they get to go out to dinner of their choice at a place of their choice. And if they choose to go out to a dinner of 60 kilometres away, we honour that. We build trust with them. And once you build the trust, then they'll start changing. Some boys will come here and they've got no respect for you or anything, you know. Um, three months is not a long time, but they, you can see the difference when they leave and it's, it puts them on another, you know, the road that they should be on instead of going off to the road that they shouldn't be on.
opened the doors late January 2006 and since then we've had approximately 130 boys go through the year, uh, which is high traffic. And we've only had 57 out of that 130 that have graduated. So it's an honour to graduate here. 45 of those 57 are still engaged in full-time study. And it needs to be said that these boys were chronic truants when they came here. We have three boys that are actually full-time employed. We've got an apprentice uh, carpenter, an apprentice butcher, and a shearer. Um, there's eight other boys who have left school and who are looking for work and or thinking of returning to TAFE. So they haven't made a decision yet. Um, and we've got one little boy that's incarcerated in his on remand out of 57. So I think that's a pretty significant outcome. Whilst it might be expensive to put a child through to Candy in a borough, for a child to be incarcerated in the criminal justice system is costing anywhere from 250000 to $290,000 per annum. And to Candy Inabara is breaking a cycle of unemployment, incarceration, poor health, all the things that come with being a disadvantaged Aboriginal person in Australia today. If we spend the money up front, on these boys, you'll get a greater, everlasting change, a transgenerational change, in fact. We're teaching the boys to be resilient. They need to be resilient. They're Aboriginal boys, and life isn't a box of chocolates for Aboriginal kids. And they need to be able to bounce back from the disappointments they're bound to have. But if they can look after themselves, if they can make better decisions, if they can do things and, and behave well that keep them out of the criminal justice system, the likelihood of them having a better life is significantly improved. My name's Ryan Bullard and I'm here to say I'm a courier man from the Ranger Way. I'm here at the Candy Way out west, showing my folks that I'm the best. Been here now for a while, showing my brothers all my stuff. Cause that's the way I do it and that's the way I roll. Little doula's gonna kick down your door. My name is John Payne, yeah, that's my name. I come from Lake and I know my game. So Listen everybody, it's time to get down. I'm the one and only Ethan Simpson in town. I box for a boss fight and I'm pretty deadly. So don't ever think that you beat me. Well done, boys. Well done. Now, with with a lot of our kids uh, in the remote communities, they're very influenced through through um, hip hop and and what they see on television. So, look at the ways in which we can include that in the curriculum. Look at ways in which we can include some of their their other cultural skills, hunting and gathering, in the curriculum. And we've seen that uh, already. Uh, when I was travelling through the Pinjara lands, we saw that with bush tucker, where they're growing that within the community. It's related to the school curriculum, and so they learn everything about nutrition, about weights and measures, about selling, marketing, etc. And, and the third thing is to allow people to enjoy themselves. And, and part of that enjoyment is once you feel secure, uh, you, you start to learn, and that learning can help you transition to employment. Um, but give people opportunities to, to look at the vast range of employment options there are. We shouldn't restrict people to just thinking that their options are limited. And, um, you know, we've seen that already, that, that with schools where, say, Chris Sarah taught in Queensland, Sherberg, where the kids were encouraged, they were made to feel positive, they did excel, and then they move on to employment and, uh, and further study. So that's all important. Well, what we know is that if you have a strong sense of identity, then you're probably going to do better in, in your life outcomes in general. So having a strong sense of identity, having a sense of control over your life are both important just in terms of your general health and well-being, and that includes mental health as well. And part of having a strong identity, of course, is connected to your cultural identity. And so I think that that's actually a very important aspect of child development in general. However, on the flip side, um, given the levels of disadvantage that people are experiencing, Aboriginal people are actually doing very well. They're actually coping with an enormous array of both historical trauma as well as present levels of disadvantage and morbidity. And by and large, they're not doing too badly. When I consider some of the young people that I see at the university that come through our courses and our preparatory courses and get into medicine, 
medicine, they're dealing with enormous stressors and yet they're functioning, they're achieving and some of them are graduating as doctors. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the level of resilience that's just inherent in some of our families and communities as well. That's where, where resilience comes from, doesn't it? It comes from pride. If you've got pride in yourself, um, you can develop a resilience that will allow you to get through um, most situations. I'm a Yungar man from the, from the southwest of Western Australia. My land is, is my land and that's where I come from. I need to develop that so that uh, these young fellows have that knowledge too. And they don't come into this vacuum and say, oh, I'm a brown skinned man um, walking around uh, in a Western world. What does that all mean? If we provide our kids with good education and we make sure that they're reaching the benchmarks that other, other Australian children are reaching, we would presume, and I think it's a safe presumption to make, that Aboriginal kids will have the knowledge, the confidence to turn into adults, that great transition zone from child to adult is a big step in anyone's language. These are just a few examples of programs having a positive impact on our Indigenous adolescents. Education, culture and community support are all key factors in helping our youth develop pride and resilience so they can be really strong and deadly. Now don't forget to visit our website for more information. Our next live broadcast will be on Tuesday the 25th of November called Sugar in the Bush, Rural and Remote Diabetes. Don't forget for any further details about the content or schedule for upcoming programs, log on to rhef.com.au.